example of a cover letter with your guys. It's actually my cover letter for when I applied for this job. Um, and I'd be happy to share it and other uh, materials with people as sort of models, things to look at when you're, when you're working on your own documents. Just send me an email and I'd, I'd be happy to, to send them to you. Um, so what I thought I would do is I would just show this to you uh, and sort of go through the elements um, paragraph by paragraph. There we go. Um, uh, go through the elements with you and some of the reasoning behind it. Um, and then afterwards, I think it's the format we do questions afterwards or other people comment to well, kind of add their ideas. I think people add their ideas okay. and then just open it up to questions. Okay, so I'll just go through this in you know, five to ten minutes. Um, so this is sort of what uh, the letter should look like. And I'll talk a little bit about both content and issues of form. So the first thing you're doing um, is you definitely want this to be on official institutional letterhead. Um, it shows that um, you know how to work in a professional context and you're, you're aware of the importance of institutional affiliation. Um, so you should be able to, to get that. Uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, I think maybe, well, it depends which. <laughs> it depends which department you're in, but uh, the program coordinator should be able to provide that with you. Um, and also, don't be scared to um, sort of mess with the letterhead a little bit. Like the branding office has pretty strict rules, I've noticed, but I don't think you should be bound by those because another formal thing is you really don't want this to be longer than two pages. Uh, and some of these letterheads have this is the U Chicago letterhead. Uh, I was a student there when I was applying, and it actually had this really ugly thing coming down the side with address and stuff like that. And it made my you sent us a fake letterhead. I had I got. <laughs> <laughs> Don't feel feel like I cut that off. It was too much space. Feel free to feel free to um, mess with it a little bit to make it work for you. Right. Uh, the important thing is that it gets that official look to it. Um, another thing too about fonts. Um, someone had described to me Times New Roman as the sweatpant of fonts, um, which I think is a good way to put it. Uh, I mean, you don't want to go crazy with something really strange or sloppy looking. Um, this is actually a font called Linux Libertine, which is similar to Nine Times New Roman, but has um, nicer ligatures. I think it looks a little bit cleaner. Um, so um, yeah, experiment with different fonts. If you have sort of a graphic designer friend, they may be able to provide some advice. I like serif fonts. I think the serif font is a good idea. Um, for a letter because it's a little bit more academic looking, uh, has a little more authority behind it. Uh, but there's different directions you could go. But yeah, I think um, anything you can do to sort of make the letter stand out in a subtle way, like using a font that's not the default font for the word processor, um, is a good idea. Um, so next, of course, you have, uh, you know, you're going to start with some sort of formal greeting. Here I have dear members of the search committee. Uh, if you know who the chair of the search committee is, it's a good idea to use their name. Um, I didn't for this letter, but others I, I did, and I would mention that the chair of the search committee's name. Um, sometimes a, a nice trick to use, so some people will sort of just send cold emails to the, to the department asking who to address it to. I, I, I never did that. But if I knew someone at the department already, um, I would send them an email and be like, hey, uh, how's it going? And by the way, who's the, who's the chair of this search committee? Um, and sometimes they'd say, it's me. Um, and that would be a nice way to remind them that, hey, my, my application is coming. Uh, you know, look for it. Um, so that's, a, that's a, a good thing to do. Um, so now we get into the body of the letter. So one thing you want to do is you want to read the ad the job posting pretty carefully to see if anything sticks out um, at what, what they might be looking for um, and how to uh, present yourself. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but yeah, usually the first paragraph you're going to be just sort of introducing yourself. I said I'm a scholar of Persian literature with a specialization in medieval religious poetry. And I'm writing to apply for the position of yada, 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 yada. Um, I definitely open with, I'm a, I'm a scholar, I'm a researcher, not I'm a student. 
or I'm even a PhD candidate. Um, those things may be true, but um, in fact, they're almost certainly true. Uh, but you, you don't want to start off presenting yourself as, as a student, right? Because you're applying to be a colleague, a junior colleague, but, but a colleague nonetheless. So emphasize that you're a scholar. Um, and if there's ABD or something like that, I mean, I wouldn't even say that. I said I defended my dissertation with honors in the department of so-and-so on this date, right? Uh, I hadn't, didn't have my degree yet, technically. Um, but I would go that route. And if you have a defense date schedule, put, put that date down. I don't say I'm ABD, say I'm defending my dissertation in two weeks. Um, so then next, you're probably going to have um, a paragraph about your, your dissertation. Um, you're probably going to want it. To all, of these, all of these paragraphs should be tailored for each letter you're writing, um, for each school you're applying to. Um, Again, I'll, I can talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, so you're probably going to have a paragraph about your dissertation. This is actually kind of long. If I were rewriting this letter again, I would make this a lot shorter. Um, and then after your dissertation paragraph, you're probably going to have another paragraph about, um, uh, and that's the one that's sort of split between these two pages, another paragraph about the lot broader research plan. And that's, that. I mean, if you can have that be the focus and be larger than your dissertation paragraph, that's great because the dissertation is sort of a student work. It's something in the past, it's done, um, even though you've spent all this time on it and it's something that you probably really love or maybe really hate um, and it's dominated your, your academic career. Um, it's, it's something you want to, it's still a piece of student work, right? So you, you want to sort of present that as something that's done, it's signed, sealed, and delivered, or almost delivered, and you have a broader sort of research plan moving forward. Um, and you can point to other sorts of projects you have ongoing, start thinking about sort of second projects, second book projects, um, point to articles you've published or in progress, um, and somehow try to tie them together in a nice sort of way that you have certain thematic strands in your research that you're pursuing. Um, so that can be really difficult to do. I mean, especially when you really you're right at the beginning of your your careers as academics and researchers. Um, but it's never too early to start thinking about you know what is what is coming out of the dissertation, what what articles or books are going to come out of it. Um, and of course, some of these may just be sort of vague ideas. Um, you know, years down down the road, uh, probably what you say is going to be your second mono monograph project is probably going to change, right? Um, and that's OK. I don't think you know, the, anyone's going to come get you uh, in four years if you applied to a school with saying something is your second monograph project and it turns out to be somewhat different. But the idea, idea is just to show that you're thinking, you're aware of this, right? And you're aware of these expectations and sort of a broader research um, program. Um, so then you're probably going to have a paragraph about your teaching. Um, and the challenge here, I think, is you're probably also going to be sending in a teaching philosophy. And so you want to not just say the same thing, right? You don't want to just sort of cut and paste from your teaching philosophy into this, because people are going to be reading both documents, and no one wants to read the same thing twice. It looks sloppy. Um, so sort of think about articulating what you articulate in the teaching philosophy, but in a, in a, different, in a different way. Um, and this is also um, an a, uh, area in which you can tailor uh, the letter to the needs of the institution that you're applying to. Um, so actually, I can sort of show you. Um, I was digging around to find the ad that Arizona put out last year. Um, here we go. So this was the ad that was put out. Um, and you can see I even sort of went through and highlighted different things that I thought would be important. Um, uh, where was it? So somewhere here it says, Okay, 
So Bay Area's specialization and discipline are open. However, scholars of Iranian history and literature are particularly encouraged to apply. And so I mostly do literature, but I was sort of eager to show in the letter that, in the letter that I could deal with historical subjects and I could teach uh, history courses. So in my teaching section, um, I talked particularly about um, one course at the end that, uh, what do I call it? Poetry, Press, and Politics in Iran, which would basically be a sort of uh, 20th century Iranian history course, right? And that was in response to what I felt was being um, articulated in the job announcement. And this is also, a, you can also sort of, if you have contacts at the university or a network, it's a good time to draw on those, right? Maybe you know grad students, um, maybe you know faculty members, um, maybe you know, you know people in other capacities or, or uh, alumni, and it's totally you know, reasonable to, to send them an email and be like, hey, I'm just applying about this job, can you tell me a little bit about the department and, and what they're looking for? I think that's a really good thing to do. Um, so then the final paragraph is probably gonna be something about sort of service and mentoring and uh, sort of other things. I had noticed that in the ad here, they talked a lot about student mentoring, so I tried to point at some other things that I had done at Northwestern and at University of Chicago um, that involved student mentoring. Um, this is also a good place if you have sort of other connections to the institution, maybe you're applying somewhere, you know, in Tennessee and you grew up in Tennessee or, you know, pointing to these little, these little sorts of connections that um, uh, might make you an attractive candidate and show that you're interested in the school and also show that you've done some sort of non-trivial research on it, right? That you're not just sending out a form letter to, to every school, but you've, you've thought about the kinds of programs that they offer and how you would fit into them. Um, I should say, so this, this sort of order that I used of sort of dissertation project and then research program and then teaching is probably the kind of order you're gonna want for most jobs. I mean, even smaller liberal arts schools, you know, places like Carleton College or Grinnell, I mean, they, they really want top researchers these days. Um, so I think research is a good thing to front for most jobs. Although some schools, especially ones with higher teaching loads, you may consider putting the teaching paragraph first. Um, but even for liberal arts colleges these days, I think that research going for us is probably a pretty good bet. Um, one way you might get a sense of this, there was one job I applied for that I went online to the department website, and you should of course be doing this for every job you apply for. And I noticed that they all had teaching first on their faculty websites and in their CVs as well. So that seemed to be something about the culture there. Um, and so I put my teaching paragraph first. Um, I did not get an interview, but I thought I was really clever for doing that. <laughs> um, okay, so then, um, yeah, you know, end with some sort of formal sign off. I said I'm very excited about the opportunity to join the Skyline Educational Community at the University of Arizona, something like that. I, I would stay away from language. I mean, I, I would try to keep it sort of real here, right? Like you're applying for a job, but it's still a job and not to be, you know, oh, I'd be so honored and it would be a dream come true and all my life I wanted to be a professor at wide. Like this kind of language, um, I think comes off sounding a little naive maybe. Um, and also it sort of reinforces this hierarchy that you were, you know, sort of the supplement coming. And, uh, that's not what you, what you want to project, right? So I would, you know, be, how you are, you're, you're excited, um, but you, you know, your eyes are open and you know that um, it's a job, right? And that there's other jobs out there as well. Um, then yeah, you can have a little sincerely. Um, I like to put a little signature on there. You can do this easily with your phone. You know, you can get apps that'll trace your, your signature so you can add a, add a digital signature. Um, you could even do it different colors. I mean, if it were blue, it, it would be probably even better because it would look uh, even more human. Um, so that's the, the, the overview. I think one last thing I would add is that, yeah, you want to you sort of, you want to project um, some confidence in your work and that you're, you're not sort of in student mode anymore, right? 
uh, and that can be difficult to do. One thing I would say is don't call, I mean, you can, you can open the, the, the formal greeting, you know, dear um, Dr. So-and-so and members of the committee. But after that, I would never refer to anyone as doctor or professor, um, even if you're saying, you know, I met so-and-so and I would want to um, be interested in collaborations with them. I would do first name, last name. I wouldn't refer to your advisors as I'm a student of Dr. So-and-so. Uh, I would put yourself on the same um, sort of uh, footing. Right? You're someone who has a degree or is very close to a degree um, and isn't a student but is a young, early career scholar. Um, so I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, yeah, how should we do questions? Okay, I mean, we had envisioned letting them all Okay, so like we can get So just keep a note of your question. Okay. And again, I'd be happy to share any of these documents with people. Um, oh, and one last thing. Get people to read your letters, right? So that's the most important piece of advice I could give. Get people to read that. Um, your advisor, your friends, People who the people who are going to be reading your letter probably are not specialists in your field, well, right? I can say something more. That's why they're trying to hire someone. Some of them may be close or aligned, and some of them, especially if you're applying to you know a small college, you might be an anthropologist, but you're applying to like a global studies program. There could be you know an economist or something on, on the committee. So get lots of different people in different fields to read your letters. Does it make sense? Can they understand it? Uh, is it compelling? Uh, and don't make typos. Uh, okay. Well, I could add a couple of things about the letters. Um, so, personally, I don't care about fonts when I look at letters. I don't know, maybe other people do, so I wouldn't worry about that too much, but you do want it to look nice. But, um, okay, a really important thing with a letter is that your paragraph on your dissertation you have to make it sound like it's intellectually exciting to people who don't have no clue about the subject matter. Okay, so you have to try to, so the challenge is you present it in a way that shows you know about the subject matter, but it's also connected with big issues that everyone is interested in. Okay, so you really have to um, think about how you want to present your, um, what your dissertation is about and what it's, why, you know, why is this interesting to lots of academics, not just people in your field, but people in other fields and connected fields. So you want to give that big picture and make it sound exciting. Okay, because if, you know, a lot of people, if they see something very technical and, you know, they consider it boring and, of limited interest, you know, they're they're not gonna be interested in that. And uh, so that's a very challenging part, okay? And then, um, then of course, you wanna be able to talk about what you'll be doing in the future, and that's especially important, you know, when you have an interview or a campus visit, so I'll let you talk about that more. Um, and teaching, of course, you want to show, like, even if you're really into research, I mean, all of us here are really into research, right? But you have to make it, you know, um, show that you have a strong commitment to teaching, like you're interested in that, you've thought about it. And I mean, obviously you have a small space, so you can't say too much, but just get something in there that shows you've thought about this and you care about it. Okay, and then the same thing at the end, um, you do want to show, like a lot of these universities, they may wonder whether people are really interested in them or they're just applying to 60 jobs, and this is one of them. Okay, so you do have to say something there that says, you know, I've thought about this university and I am interested in your university. You know, I, I would like to teach there. Like, show that you, at least, you know, obviously this is like one sentence or two sentences, but say something that shows you thought about this university and it does hold interest for you. You do not want it to sound like it's just a job I'm applying for and, um, you know, 
um, because they know you may, you know, if they like you, then they probably they think you'll get other interviews. They don't want to just get a short list of people who aren't interested in their university. You know, they're trying to avoid that most places. So, um, yeah, those are the things I would add. I'll also say one last thing about that. I don't know if everyone does this, but uh, I was advised to put the names of the people who are writing my letters at the end of the uh, letter, uh, because a lot of universities don't necessarily ask for letters uh, in advance, but you, you say, these are the people who are willing to write for me. And you mentioned that at the end of the cover letter as a way to sort of um, either attract attention or show what kind of intellectual community you're part of. And, and the people who read that letter might know uh, those people might understand the kind of research you're doing based on the people that are writing for you. Um, I think that's good advice, because you have to remember that the people who are reading your letters are really interested in reading it, and they're looking for a new colleague. They're not just looking for a researcher or a specific topic. It needs to be someone that they would like to have in their department. Um, if, in the teaching section, if you have another section on teaching philosophy and other things, or something that you put in your CV that tells about the kind of things you have taught or are willing to teach, that's fine. But they're going to want to think how you fit into their department. So if you can say, you know, I have experience teaching these courses and I'm, I would also be excited to develop a seminar on X, they, they start to get a sense of how you would fit with them. But again, that's often a, a calculated thing. You think about um, what would fit with that department. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and every, any chance you have, I mean, every one of these paragraphs should be based on research that's on, on the university, right? So, especially the teaching was one place I really like to do that because you could say, right, um, I'm excited about you know, the interdisciplinary possibilities in this department, and here are some courses I would like to teach to do that. I'm excited about um, yeah. the Aeneas' commitment to strong language pedagogy and you know, so-called content courses, and here's the way that I would like to use. Yeah, and even in the rest of the letter, um, you know, like Austin was saying, each job has a specific job description. They're looking for something specific. So you have to pitch yourself towards that thing that they're looking, you know, as best you can. Obviously, if it looks fake, that's not going to help you. But um, you have to do it in a way that's realistic, but you you do have to say, why are you qualified for this, for what they're looking for? Um, and, uh, you know, because there might be other people who are, that's right up their alley and you have to compete with them. So make sure you bring that up. Whatever you have that connects with what they're looking for, bring that out, you know, in, in the letter for that job. And if I can just say one last thing, like definitely, uh, I mentioned this before, but draw on your network, contact people you know. Uh, it can be a lot of help. Um, I can tell you I applied for a job once, because the ads, they're looking for specific things, but sometimes the ad has no, doesn't tell you at all what they're looking for. Right, you'd be so vague, and you gotta go and talk to people to figure out what they actually want. I applied for this job that was, was like a Islamic, uh, Iranian studies at Stanford or something, and it had, um, it made it sound like you could be anything. You could be a specialist of anything. And I spent a weekend writing the application. And on the online application, the last step was, oh, in which department do you want your application sent to? Political science, art history, philosophy, or something else. Is that what I'm serious? <laughs> so you know, do the, do the research, click through the online application, see what you're actually applying to. Uh, don't get stuck doing a lot of work for, for something you're not. Don't have a chance at. Sure. So congratulations, you got a campus visit. This is uh, actually a big step because if you have a campus visit, you, that means you're one of three or four people who are up for this job. Uh, and um, sometimes the process will be that you just send a letter and a writing sample and you'll get a campus visit with that without having any kind of like a um, 15 minute interview in between. Sometimes you'll submit a letter and you'll be asked to 
submit extra materials afterwards, and maybe you'll do a Skype interview for 15 minutes, maybe you'll do a conference interview for 15 minutes. So every, every uh, university works differently in terms of like, how they structure the search and how, what the kind of expectations they have uh, from the moment they receive your letter to the, to the point of the campus visit. But if you made it to the campus visit, you've already covered all of those grounds quite well, and, you're, and the department is interested in you, so you can go show up in that, um, show up having some kind, some, a lot of confidence in the kind of research that you do, and be ready for the conversations, that, and be excited for the conversations that you're going to have with your potential colleagues. So, so before the prep, I think it's really important to know what you'll be asked to do during the campus visit, because it's every campus visit is different. Every university has different expectations. European universities have completely different campus visits than uh, British universities. American universities have different structures. Um, and, and it's important to be ready for these things. So for instance, um, if you go to a UK, a British school for a campus visit, you shouldn't be surprised to see all the other applicants already also there on that day. So British universities invite all of their uh, candidates on the same day. Most likely you'll have lunch with the other candidates uh, and with the search committee, and then everyone will present their work uh, one after the other on that afternoon, and you'll watch all the, the other uh, candidates' presentations. And it's, and, a uh, and it's a shorter presentation, it's a 20 to 30 minute presentation. And in the evening, you'll all have dinner together. And you'll find out the next day, most and likely. The one is still standing the next morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You'll find out the next morning whether you've, uh, whether you've gotten the job well, or not. The, the big interview. Yeah, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you also like, have a, really, the main thing is this big interview. You have like very formal with yeah. all these university people. Yeah. Yeah. But the interview is individual. You only show up for your, the other candidates are not there while you're interviewing, but there's a big committee of like people, inc that, and the committee might include people like a vice provost or a, uh, or an assistant dean or people like that who are actually uh, not part of the department but who have administrative responsibilities in the school. Um, and yeah, and their searches are really quick, and actually, yeah, you'll find out the next day whether you've received, if you've gotten the job or not. Uh, and European universities are different. Uni European universities usually give you a task. They tell you that, for instance, they'll say, when you show up, you're, we're going to expect you to give a talk about how you fit our department. So your talk is not going to be a, only a research talk, but your talk is going to address what all the colleagues do in that department and what kind of conversations you might have with those colleagues. American universities, on the other hand, uh, I mean, I think most American universities uh, have you know, a research talk, a job talk, which uh, summarizes the main points of your talk, of your research, but also has, you know, a very detailed example of how you um, conduct that larger investigation in a very sort of small, detailed manner. I'll talk more about the job talk in a few minutes. Um, and, and with U.S. universities, I think one thing that you should be careful about is whether you're going to liberal arts colleges or research university. But at Liberal Arts College, you're going to have a lot of uh, uh, time. You're going to be spending a lot of time with undergrads while you're, on, while you're on campus. Most likely, you'll have a breakfast or a lunch scheduled with undergrads. The undergrads will ask you questions. And they might ask you questions about your research, but uh, they'll also want to know what kind of um, innovations you might bring to the school in terms of teaching, how you would be as an advisor. Uh, how much time you'd be willing to spend with them on a weekly basis, or have you advised uh, undergraduate um, thesis projects before, etc. So, um, so liberal arts college and research university will have different expectations on cam on campus during campus visit. Um, and so, so best thing to do in order to prepare for this, these distinct, this, these diverse styles is to, of course, as Austin said before, is to find a colleague who might know about that university, who might already, who might be a grad student from that, at that university, who might have taught at that university before, might have interviewed there before, and use your network in order to um, have some, you know, uh, have some uh, sense of what you might expect, what's ahead. Um, but regardless of all of these differences, I think um, in all of these universities, the most important part of the uh, campus visit is the job talk. Okay, so I'll go to the job talk first, and now I'll come to the campus visit. 
uh, campus interviews. So what you need to do before you, while you're preparing for the job talk is to read the ad carefully. As Austin showed, I mean, it's, I think, really important to uh, understand exactly what the department wants and, and know how your uh, research might fit that, that department's expectations. And imagine that you're in a conversation with all of the colleagues that you're going to have there in that department, both the colleagues you have in the search committee and also the colleagues you'll have in the department later on. And, and, and the job talk has to uh, do several things. It has to give a broad picture of your research and then demonstrate how that, those larger sets of questions that you're asking in your research um, are, the, are answered in your dissertation or in your book, et cetera. And you shouldn't, I think one thing that students do that, uh, uh, especially people who are ABDs do, is uh, to cite a lot of uh, other people's work. So to provide a literature review at the beginning of the talk, which in a way is a little bit boring for the listeners. The listeners might already know the people that are actually, that are being cited in the literature review. They're not there to listen to other people's work. They're there to see how you're contributing to a larger body of literature. So you can say, OK, here's my contribution in, uh, in a paragraph, but don't go into the, all the details of like uh, x person said this, y person said this. Um, and in, if you're, having, if you're going to use a PowerPoint, and I think it's good to use a PowerPoint usually because you, know, you want to keep people alive and you want to keep, keep people listening to your presentation. And, and you also want to have something to refer to occasionally if you get stuck or if you're like tired or if you get excited, I don't know. So you can turn to it and like take a deep breath and then continue and face the audience. So I think it's good to have um, that kind of distraction. And, and also you might use images that demonstrate the points you're making in your work. So if you're talking about a specific city, you might want to include a map. If you're going to talk about a specific, say, ethnographic moment in your research, you might want to sort of have an image from that, um, that space where you had your interview, or if you're using historical examples, you might want to sort of maybe use a, uh, some kind of digital representation of the archives, etc. cetera. And, and I think, uh, so this, the job talk is going to be a 45 minute talk, and then you're, depending on the campus, you're gonna have a 30 minute or a 45 minute Q&A. So the Q&A is also, is going to be almost as long as the job talk and is the place where you actually get to connect with people. So people are going to ask you questions based on, maybe they're going to ask questions based on things they didn't fully understand in the talk. Maybe they're going to be asking questions based on, um, you know, they're reflecting using their own work as a lens. Um, or maybe they're going to try to understand how your, again, like work fits in a larger body of literature. I think it's really important to engage with people and not be defensive and not be sort of um, uh, not be close to the conversation. I think that that the Q and A is the point where you're showing that you're like you're a good colleague and you're willing to be in conversation with people and that you're going to be excited to answer people's questions and excited to be part of the department and part of the sort of grad grad student community if there are grad students. So. This is, I actually took this, I mean, I read the, a lot of people read professors in website while they're preparing for campus visits. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, uh, but I actually took this structure from the professors in website. Um, and, and the website has a lot of detailed information on every uh, little piece of the um, job process, of the job market process. It's a useful uh, tool, but I don't think you need to take I mean, take it with a grain of salt, for instance. One of the pieces of advice that I read there was, you should always wear a brown suit for your campus visit. And I was like, oh, brown suits? I don't really like brown suits. I think I'm going to just like choose something that I like and not necessarily like follow every little piece of information yeah, that you provide. Show up in the UK and all of you have a brown suit. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. You don't want to be, you don't want to lose your individual like, uh, you know, Preferences completely, but just uh, you know, it's nice to have the guidance of certain kinds of um, structures. Anyway, and so this is the structure that uh, she shares on her website. And actually, I, I mean, I think this is actually a good, um, uh, good simple advice about the job talk. So present your original and distinctive arguments. So you've worked on this project for five to ten years, you must be saying something that other people have not said before. And 
to, your job is to be able to deliver that uh, argument in a very concise and sort of specific manner, while at the same time showing that this is, this is related to sort of a larger body of work, right? You're always, you always have a larger body of work in mind while they're talking. Uh, so the structure would be a clear one paragraph intro that lays out the topic and sketches the basic plan mm -hmm. of the talk. Two paragraphs to explain your topic clearly for first time listeners. Keep in mind that, again, it's, this is, you might be, as Austin was saying, you might be an anthropologist of, um, I don't know, Jordan, and you show up in a department where you, of global studies where the people that are listening to you are like um, historian of Japan and economist that works on like, uh, you know, income inequality in the US and someone who works in like sort of literature in Latin America, right? So you have to have a sense of the uh, diversity of the department. These are all going to be scholars that are interested in listening to your work and understanding your work, but you should also try to make things a little bit easier for them by being you know, open and um, sort of clear. Um, as I said before, avoid excessive citation of others' works and include a conclusion that summarizes what you covered. So at the end of the talk, if you've been talking for 45 minutes, people might have uh, missed some of the points that you were making. It's very nice to um, listen to sort of someone wrap up their arguments at the end. And again, include visuals that illustrate the points of the talk. And even if you're reading, and a lot of people read when they're doing their job talks, and that's considered uh, acceptable, but even if you're reading, it's always good to read with a sort of, in a way that's not just like, hi everyone, now I'm reading my job talk, right? You should be like, uh, hi, I'm happy, to hear, I'm happy to be here, thank you for inviting me, and then just refer to that talk, but always be in touch with the audience while they're talking. Okay. Um, so who's professor? Is professor? It's called professor is in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is. Uh, I will talk briefly about campus interviews, and yeah, you think you, I guess you go into it more deeply, right? Um, so uh, campus interviews. These are things that are that are actually quite basic. So you've. You applied for a job in a department that, um, and you've read the job into uh, the job ad carefully, and you've written out this uh, beautiful letter, and now you're going to meet these colleagues for the mostly, most likely for the first time. So when you show up there, don't ask. By the way, what were you working on? You should know what people do. You should have read some of their work. You don't. You're not going to be expected to have read everything they have published, but you should have a general sense of their interests, the kind of questions that they ask, and when, maybe when you meet them, you say, oh, are you still working on X, or are you, are you going to continue working on Y? Make sure they didn't do that in the 60s. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you don't, yeah, I mean, they're not going to quiz you about their own work, but it's a little bit, I think, upsetting for people if you show up there and if you say, who are you, by the way? Which well, are you? Are you a historian? Are you an anthropologist? You know, like you have to have some some sense that you are actually following their work and you're ready to be in conversation with them. And and also again, be ready to explain how you might be, for instance, in a department, in an interdisciplinary department. You might not necessarily always know how your work speaks to another person's, um, you know, expertise or interests. But you always, I mean, it's. I think it's nice to be able to sort of find ways that demonstrate that, OK, oh, yeah, you're looking at this in this context. I'm actually looking at this in this context. But there are these you know, three parallels. Not that you have the opportunity to say all of these things uh, during the campus visit, but at least if, just in case the opportunity comes up, have like a few points ready uh, so that you don't like start stuttering when you're talking to people. So uh, yeah, talk about, and also, so this is maybe something to say about the sort of the individual research that your colleagues might do. Uh, but you always, you should be aware that you're not only going to be in conversation with individuals, you're also going to be in conversation with a sort of a larger vision of the department. So um, you might try to find out what the department wants to do in the next five, 10 years by asking the people in the, in the search committee directly. You might want to do research about that before you come to the campus visit so that you uh, have a sense of like what's going on and you have a sense of like, um, you, for instance, uh, you say like, oh, you're starting a, 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 specific, like a, a major on, a Persian major. Oh, how are you going to, like, well, these are the ways in which I could contribute to that major, right? I guess this was the case for 
your application here, right? And and if you see that vision as a sort of like a comprehensive thing, you might be able to say like, okay, uh, I'm going to be able to offer these courses that fit this vision uh, and that complement your ideas about how you want to develop the department in the future. And this includes sort of yeah, offering courses and also bringing syllabi that might be of interest to the people that are uh, interviewing you. Um, and I think it's also important to learn about campus-wide collaborations and interdisciplinary projects. Uh, and so when, you sh when you're doing your interviews, you might be able to say, OK, yeah, I'm really interested in this department, but actually this university offers something to me that beyond the department. So you know, in my case, it was important for me to bring up that you know, I work on energy issues, and, uh, and there's a big um, sort of in push towards working on energy policy across the university. And I might be able to sort of, uh, represent the department in those conversations in some ways. Um, and, and also, this will lead you to sort of think about, you know, okay, I'm going to do, uh, you know, this is my research vision. And based on this vision and based on your department's vision, uh, we might be able to find funding opportunities for future projects or future uh, developments of the department. Um, and anyway, I, I don't think these are necessarily things that you're going to be explicitly asked to spell out in interviews. But these are things that you should have in the back of your mind. So when you give responses or when you answer questions, you'll have, um, you'll have an informed perspective on what the department demands and how you might be able to contribute to that department. Um, so I'll say one last thing, and then uh, we can, I don't know, Yasin could talk, or we can open, I don't know, uh, how you proceed from here. But um, you, this is something that's going to drive you crazy, but during your uh, job search, everyone's going to tell you that this is about the fit. It's not about the, the quality of your work. It's not about the, um, the, or it's not only about the quality of your work, or it's not only about how much you've published. It's not only about how many presentations you've done and how many people you know in all of these departments, but it's about how your expertise and your personality fits the uh, expectations of that department and how you might be able to sort of, you know, um, uh, flourish together in the future, right? So this is a kind of this, and the f idea of the fit is, I think, really um, difficult because it's very vague, right? Because you don't know exactly what the department wants. Even the department doesn't know what they want, right? Until they actually see the candidates and they meet with and they talk to them. So. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, a lot, in a lot of cases, the department might really uh, admire your work, might really like what you do, uh, might really like you as a person, but they're not going to, they might not offer you a job because they think that maybe you don't fit that uh, larger vision of, uh, of what they, how they expect to develop the department or something. Uh, so it's good to keep that in mind. Of course, not obsess over it because it's not, there's not much that you can do about that, but also have that. I mean, I think that's why it's important to be able to talk to as many people as possible so that you know what, what the department might be looking for. So you emphasize those, um, you foreground those qualities um, rather than other qualities you might have. Okay. So I think I'll end there. These were all my slides. Can we go, can we stay in this room? Yeah. We'll yeah, sure. Um, okay, I think this is, um, this is pretty good. But the thing that I would add to that is um, you want to say something about what is your approach? What is distinctive about your approach? What concepts are you, you know, using in your approach um, that, you know, distinguish your work or uh, put you in a certain type of work? Uh, so make sure that you get that in there. And, and also make sure you know what when, when you do that, make sure you know what you're talking about, because you know people will ask you questions about it, and if you're just dropping lots of names, and then people ask you questions about that, you know, I mean that that's not you don't want to do that, but you want to have obviously you want to have an approach in your work that you know very well, and you can answer questions about it. So. And people will ask you. And if you don't mention what your approach is, people will ask you about that anyway. So you'll you'll have to talk about it. And uh, so I would say, you know, have a short section in which you discuss how you did 
this work, your method or approach or the concepts that are distinctive that help you carry out this work. Um, but I think this is a, you know, it's a pretty good. So you want to, um, the emphasis here is on making it accessible to academics, not, you know, not like you go on the news and everyone will understand you, but an academic audience can follow what you're saying and can be interested. And um, so you don't want to have lots of jargon um, or that kind of thing. Um, but if there are important concepts, you know, then you need to put those out there. So, and then the other thing is I would like to emphasize the points that have been made about figuring out how you fit into the department. Like, you don't want to present yourself as doing something that someone else already does. You know, then they're going to say, okay, this person, we have someone who does that. Why do we need to hire this person? We can hire the other person who fits in a gap that we don't have. So make sure that you, you're, you can present yourself as uh, filling a gap that the department has, rather than replicating someone else, okay? Which means you have to look at what they're doing and, and that kind of thing. Um, and again, of course, you know, if it's fake, that won't look good. It's, what we're talking about is how you present yourself rather than like making up something, okay? So avoid, you know, making up anything because people will realize that. And then emphasize also that if you can relate your work to what people do, and um, which means you you know what they do, and you, you looked at it, and you, you know the last thing you want to do is talk about things that are related to what someone else has done research on, and you're not citing them. In other words, you don't even know they did that. So that person is not going to be happy. You know, they're sitting there in the audience, and they're going to be like, "What about what I wrote?" You know, they're not going to like that. So, um, so we want to avoid that problem by being aware of what people have done, especially if it's connected with you. And then, you know, you can make yourself look good by relating what you say, not in a too obvious a way, but you know, you can relate what you've done to what other people do in that department. So, did we have other no, topics? I, I thought I would um, give you a little bit of an overview of what the institutional setting within which these things take place. I've served on a, a lot of search committees and chaired some, and also raised money that, that creates some of the new positions. So I think when you, you see, you might see that different ads are coming out at all different times, and there are different ways that these come about. Um, these days especially, I think it's less and less common for departments to simply replace a position when someone retires. There may be a very particular initiative that's donating some funding towards a position. Um, there might be, like the, with Title VI, we leverage hires with very particular foci, like environmental studies of the Middle East, or when the Roshan GIDP was developed, then the opportunity came for a hiring um, in Persian studies, and we were fortunate enough to hire Austin O'Malley. So um, you can see that if you understand a little bit about what's going on in the institution, it helps you understand better um, what they're looking for. And if that's not evident to you, your ideas of doing the research, asking people, I think are very important. Um, the committees get lots of applications, you know, 80, 90, 100, well more, depending on the subject. So you really want yours to stand out. And always there are a few that are, are simply not even relevant, and those get put aside. There are some where people don't make a good case for themselves, um, or you think maybe they're just too early in their career. They, it looks like they won't finish their degree by the time the job starts, and that's not necessarily good, because there are plenty of people with degrees in hand at the time a job starts, so they'll focus their attentions on those. So those are just things to um, keep in mind. 
But usually the process that um, we've been through here is that we develop a long list. We might have 10, 11, 12. I think with the Persian search, we had 14 people that we interviewed by Skype. And that gives you a chance, because that, that usually indicates that as a committee, you find a lot of people interesting, but you have different minds about it. You're not quite sure. You kind of want to meet them. And then you have to narrow it, because you can only afford to bring three or four people to campus. So those um, Skype interviews are important. You dress formally. You treat it as though you were in a room with the people. Or at least your top half should be. Yes. The top <laughs> um, well, Austin was standing during his, so you might want to <laughs> be, be careful of the, the, um, the whole presentation. But, but those things um, really matter. So you can, can watch out for, for those as well. Um, then, at, then a certain amount of, um, oh, during the Skype interview, it's very common at the end to ask you if you have you any questions. So think about it. Do you have any questions? This is a really nice opportunity for you to ask the committee. A really common one is, what is your timeline for decisions? You can imagine if you turn things off, the people are gone, and then you think, when am I going to hear from them? It's just really comforting to know exactly what the schedule is. So you can ask them about that, or if there's something else you'd like to know. Um, they, you know, do ask, and they, they'll welcome that. But if you don't ask, you can follow up later, but it's nice to hear, um, I think, right then and there. With the um, with this, a campus visit, I brought with me the schedule for um, the one that we did uh, with Austin, just to give you an idea. Um, some of you participated in these as students, taking people around campus, or you talk with them. But it's a kind of grueling process. People get exhausted during these. So just be physically ready for this, something of a marathon. You, know, you arrive, probably someone meets with you the first night, just chats with you, gets to know you, orients you to the process. They, too, can answer questions about the visit. It's nice to get your itinerary ahead. And then look up the people, too, on the itinerary with whom you're meeting. Um, always at University of Arizona, you meet with an associate dean or a dean. Because they, too, at that higher level, want to know what kind of candidates are being brought in. And they get a sense, too. Um, it happens, though not often, but sometimes a department can forward a recommendation for a hire uh, uh, from their several candidates, and a dean can say, no, I want you to hire that one. I mean, these things even happen. So these, these meetings are not just formal. They, they really do matter. So um, look into that as well. There might be a meeting with the entire faculty. You sit down and tell them a little bit about yourself, and then they ask you lots of questions as a group. Um, you might also have a library or campus tour. If things are scheduled, participate in them. We've had candidates in the past who won't show up. And they just blow it off, and that is not a candidate who will be taken seriously. I know. <laughs> That's what well, we thought. They didn't go, they blow off a tour, or they, oh, yeah. they don't go to a talk? So no, it was a tour. But even so, that's a sign of respect for the people who organized your schedule. There's a reason for everything. Yeah, so if you have these things, do them. Um, meals matter. People are watching you. You know how? You know, are you polite? Yeah, table how are you? Ta no. no, I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm not. I have seen a couple of things happen, at, even at dinners, where people basically um, did themselves no favors as far as being a candidate. You're always on. You always have to be conscious of the fact that people are really paying attention to what you're doing and saying. So um, just do have that in mind. You may be meeting with people from some other departments as well. But again, if you have the itinerary, you can look them up ahead. In your job talk, um, what you mentioned about talking about something you know well, for most people it will be their dissertation. Occasionally you find someone who's done a dissertation, they've been out for a while, come back to give a talk. And we had one candidate who chose a subject that was very new research that wasn't quite cooked yet. Um, but she was very excited about it. But it didn't come off as together and theoretically sophisticated. You bring your absolutely best, most polished presentation, and something you know really, really well. You just can't afford to take chances. Because some people said, well, this, you know, maybe she just hasn't finished this work yet, but it did not seem theoretically sophisticated. This wouldn't work for our department. This was with another yeah, department. Many people who are like the complete front runner, mm -hmm. when they come to campus, they blow it with the talk. So mm -hmm. you, you have to be careful. Mm -hmm. you know, the talk is very important. Yeah, it's hugely important. And have multiple copies, because things can always go wrong with technology, with anything else. So have it on a thumb drive, have it on paper, have it in the cloud. Just if anything goes wrong, you don't want to be rattled. 
you want to think, oh, don't worry, you know, I'm covered, I've got this. So uh, that way you're calm, you look like a competent colleague, which indeed you would be, but it also, for your sake, um, makes you not get too worried. So just have every possibility covered that you possibly could. Um, then you may have um, meetings with students, including graduate students, or they may take you, you know, on a hike, on a walk, on a tour. Please, uh, those things too have to be taken very seriously. In searches that um, I've worked on, I've asked students afterwards for a report, and sometimes those student reports had been something that basically put a candidate off the list because someone behaved um, with students in, uh, this is many, many, many years ago, there was one candidate when taken on a trip to the Desert Museum by students, never addressed a comment to one of the female students. Not one of them, not the entire several hours that he was with the group of students. And you can imagine when that came back to us, um, we just said, this is unacceptable. You know, we need someone who can deal with all our students equally. So um, things that you might not even think about. I don't know if he was even conscious of the fact that he did that, but um, these things all do matter. And after you get back, you send a thank you note. Um, if you haven't brought syllabi with you, it could be that people are interested in your syllabi and have not requested them as part of the packet. Have them in your briefcase. I remember, Austin, you had syllabi. It's very common to either hand them to people, which people are impressed by, because not everyone does, or send them to people immediately after you get back. If there's something you know they would be interested in that you have, as soon as you get home with, as part of your thank you. And you thank everyone on the search committee. You know, the chair and all the search committee members, um, not just one person, not just Personally, the chair. I don't care. If you, but, <laughs> but yeah, it's a good idea. Do you send emails separately to each committee Some people send it as See, one. Some people don't. Some do, do it as <laughs> some do it as uh, some do it as one. Some do them separately. I mean, there, there are different ways, but just let people. It reminds them of you too. You know, I so enjoyed meeting you. I look forward to hearing of you. But I think that reminding people of you, because they may be on to the next candidate by then. So you want to make sure to do that. Um, I think that um, those are the... Do you have a question about that point? Yeah, um, yeah. Do you send that after you have the phone interviews or just an in-person visit? Um, you can do it after the phone interviews. It's nice to do a short one, but certainly after the in-person visit. Okay. I, I tend to think it's good to thank people um, often. <laughs> they, they appreciate it and some people don't do it. So when you do do it, it stands out. You know, that, that really, because people are taking their time. Think of the hours if they're reading 80 to 100 applications. They've gotten to the point of having you on a short or shorter list. I mean, they're really investing a lot of time in you. And when you get to campus, it really is true that every one of the people invited looks like a potential hire. They don't know which one is going to emerge as the one that everyone likes best. And here we had um, questionnaires we sent to faculty members after the fact with a lot of questions about um, how they, they saw these people and also a narrative part. Also, if you do, um, here we ask people to do sample teaching of a class. And we tried very hard to have everyone teach a class at roughly the same level, all maybe 200 level or 300 level classes. And we had little surveys we gave to all of the students, and I you know, got all those statistics together, and it matters. You know, how are students looking at this? Are the students, would, we asked them uh, very simple questions like, um, would you want to take a course taught by this person? Would you recommend a course taught by this person to your friends? You know, this kind of thing, because as a department these days, you want enrollment, you want an engaging faculty member, um, and students tend to be very understanding. Some would say, well, I could tell that so-and-so is very nervous. After all, it is, you know, they are interviewing for a job, but I think they're good at such and such. They're, they're really very understanding, but they're also candid. And, and those things matter. So, you know, looking at the students in the class, engaging with them, um, they, I think it, uh, and, and just being confident in what you're delivering to them. Um, they appreciate a sense of humor, but it's not necessary. You're not there only to entertain them, but really to share information and teach them something on the day that you go into the class to teach. So um, you just do your best on all of these. Also, positions come up at different times. Usually departments try to advertise them very early in the fall uh, because they want to get on the cycle of annual meetings. For Middle East Studies, you, if you can, you want to be able to interview some people at the Middle East Studies Association meeting. Then you want to be able to invite people to campus maybe in January, early February, because you know that the best candidates are going to be um, interviewing at other institutions too, and you want to be able to offer them a job first. 
Now, some jobs get authorized late. It's not the fault of the department. They find out they've got the money. They write the job ad. Then you have to get the job ad approved. Then you advertise it. But the job ad has to be approved not only by the department, first the search committee, the department, human resources, and finally the, prov the dean, then the provost. And sometimes these things take a very, very long time. So you see some ads coming out very early and some much later. And sometimes, all of a sudden, a position gets authorized and you might even see a job ad in the spring. That's much less common, but don't stop looking. You know, these things can happen. And it all has to do with approvals and funding cycles and university priorities. You know, any questions? I think we can open up for... Okay, let me, can I just... Yeah, please. Yeah. Oh, uh, there's also... Um, I think this is like, you don't know this as a candidate when you first start going mm -hmm. on the job market, but there's also a phenomenon called the failed search. Mm -hmm. So you yeah, do all indeed. of this thing, all of these things as a candidate, and all the committee per puts so much time and effort into uh, having the, you know, having, finding a good candidate, but eventually they can't agree or the funding gets pulled and something happens and uh, the search uh, becomes, is, is not concluded. So mm -hmm. it, even when you're on a campus visit, even when you're actually, you know that you're one of the three people that are entering for that position, you don't have the security that that position is going to be uh, offered to someone until you get an offer letter, right? So, or until you actually sign a contract. I've heard cases where offer letters were sent and then uh, the jobs were canceled between the offer letter and the actual signing of a contract. Goodness. No, that's bad. <laughs> so, and and this is, it's not uncommon. It happens quite often. So it's, of course, not, uh, in a way, if the search fails, it says something about the department, it says something about sort of the uh, social, social relations in that department, uh, but, uh, or, or says something about the, the way they put together the ad. Uh, but it's good to have that in mind to us as you're going through this mm -hmm. process. Well, I think it, it's also um, the case that it's important to remember that um, for the people on the committee, they, they really do want to get to know you. And, and you wouldn't be there if they didn't really think there was something very promising about your work and your application. So it's very positive when you get there. And even if you end up interviewing for a job and you don't get the job, that interviewing experience is very important because you're going to be better the next time. I've known students who were just finishing their dissertation, maybe even got to a short list and went on a campus and didn't get the job, but then the following year they ended up with a great job. All that experience really contributes to be, being a better candidate, so don't regard it as um, lost time. Right, it usually takes a number of campus mm -hmm. visits to get a job, oh, but it's luck. And I might just add on to that, that um, campus visit is very stressful, of course, right? And you're going to be anxious. Um, I would always have lots of trouble sleeping before a campus visit and on a campus visit. Actually, if I were doing it again, I might bring some scotch and NyQuil or something. I mean, everybody mm -hmm. really run on little sleep, you know, so that's something to be conscious of if there's things that can help you sleep. Um, mm -hmm. So I would just be exhausted. But at the same time, um, campuses are actually fun, even though they're anxiety-inducing. Um, it's fine to have